one is Getting Started, Part One, Using and Preserving Family Sources uh, webinar. And that's, uh, we are grateful to have two wonderful presenters uh, for you today. And I'd like to uh, introduce them. First on the right there is uh, Joseph B. Everett, uh, accredited genealogist. Um, an ML has uh, ML's degree is the family and local history librarian at uh, Brigham Young University. In uh, his 25 plus year career, he has also worked for Family Search and Ancestry. He has a bachelor's in family history, genealogy, and Russian language, and a master's in library science. He's accredited in German and Russian empire research. And uh, to his left is uh, Megan Nussing, who is uh, currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in family history and genealogy at the Brigham Young University. She works as a research assistant at the BYU Library Family History Center. Her research interests include uh, Spain, Latin America, United States, and DNA. She speaks Spanish and uses her Spanish language skills in her research. Megan is passionate about teaching those around her about family history and helping people connect with their ancestors and each other's. And without further ado, I'll let them uh, start presenting. All right, thank you very much, Chris, for that introduction. And we're happy to be with everyone this afternoon um, for this part one of the Getting Started track here uh, at uh, Roots Tech. Uh, just a quick housekeeping item. Uh, uh, let's see, this one actually doesn't apply to this, but don't uh, record uh, this uh, uh, recording or take photos of, uh, but you may take the screenshots of the, of the uh, slides. This is uh, part of a track uh, getting started that is brought to you by the BYU History Department. Um, professors in family history and uh, students who are currently studying family history at BYU, including Megan, who uh, has been working with me for the past few years as a research assistant while she has been working on her master's degree. And, um, uh, BYU uh, has a unique program in that it, it has a bachelor's degree program, the only uh, such program in the United States. And uh, students have the opportunity for not only learning skills and family history, but also having experiential learning experiences such as this one, uh, presenting at Roots Tech for the first time and hopefully not the last time. I'm sure <laughs> it won't be. We'll see. Yeah. So, uh, to begin with, uh, just an overview of uh, the, the steps for getting started uh, in family history. Uh, these are steps that Family Search has taught for many years now. It really starts with yourself identifying what you know already uh, from your own memory, as well as from uh, the memories of uh, other family members and the family sources that you have in your possession. And then deciding what you would like to learn more about selecting records to search, and then obtaining and searching those records, and then using that information, uh, evaluating it, and making conclusions about it to build your family tree. This session is primarily focused on step one here, although there are some aspects that also touch on these other steps as well. So what are family sources? Um, Really, we're talking about um, physical items that you have in your possession. Um, and we'll look at some examples of those in a moment, but also your memories, uh, the things that you remember yourself and also the things that uh, your family members may, may recall. So we'll talk a little bit later about ways of gathering these resources as well. So it's really important to, uh, that when you're starting, that you start with you. Start with yourself. You have a lot of your own memories, um, uh, memories of your parents or your grandparents, perhaps, um, or other members of your family. Um, you may know facts, uh, birth dates, places, uh, and other details. 
Um, and you can begin to record those things about yourself. Um, and then uh, from there, you can start to look around you for family sources. So let's talk about some of those family sources. Uh, Megan's going to walk us through some examples. Okay. <clears throat> so types of family sources. The first source that probably comes to mind when you think of family sources are photos. These are some photographs from my own family history that I have collected and lots of photos um, show important life events or just everyday things. And they can come in different formats such as prints, slides, negatives, or digital. And I'm lucky enough to have a lot of family photos that I've gathered from my grandparents over the past couple of years. Um, we were cleaning out some of my grandparents, both of my both sides of my grandparents' houses, and I got photos from both sides because my family kind of knows I'm like the genealogist. And so these two photos I have here on the left is a photo of my grandfather when he was graduating from BYU. And then on the right is a photo of my grandparents on their wedding day. And these are just some examples of photos that you might find. And I think photos are a really great way to connect to our ancestors. Okay, the next type of family source we're gonna talk about are papers such as diaries and journals and other such things that you might find while um, collecting your family sources. And the example I have on the left is a diary that my grandmother kept. As you can see, she only wrote about four or five lines per day, but I feel like even though she wrote so little, it is just a little glimpse into her everyday life. And it's just a fun little way to um, see how she lived. And these types of sources are, um, the way that we can fill in the details and the story of our family's lives and see kind of what they were like, what they experienced, and then if we're lucky, find things about maybe how they actually felt and their own thoughts about their lives. And the next example of family source are official documents such as IDs, passports, licenses, certificates, and military service records. And as you can see, I have some examples. On the left is um, a passport from my great-grandmother, and it has her name, her birth date, birthplace, and even a small little picture of her on her passport. And, you know, these just give, like, vital information and other, like, key facts about people's lives. And then on the right is a letter from my grandfather's mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I have a lot of those from his mission as well. And like I said, these documents give us more of the facts of our ancestors' lives and inform us about the different uh, facets of their lives, like school and church and organizations that they were a part of. Next example are video things such as VHS or um was it eight millimeter? I think that's what it's called. Yeah, just if you're lucky enough to have those, I'm, I don't have very many of those, but I think VHS is such a great resource for family sources. And another is audio recordings, um, maybe cassette tapes or digital recordings that you might have. Um, that's another type. And then last type I'm going to talk about are more physical objects, such as heirlooms or clothing. And um, the example for this is my grandfather. He was a, excuse me, a member of the Utah Highway Patrol for 25 years. And on the left, this is a display that my cousin um, created to show all of these things that he has from our grandfather. And as you can see, there are hats that he wore, patches from the Utah Highway Patrol, pictures, and all these things that tell his story from his service as a high patrolman. And then on the right is a photograph from a yearbook that the Utah High Patrol put out for, I don't even know, maybe every year that like tells who the officers are and where they're serving, where they're from and some of their interests. And that's just another more unique source that you might be able to find when you're searching for family sources. And then another example, uh, is 
my grandfather's badge when he retired from the Utah Highway Patrol. And then little did I know until recently, um, my grandfather and grandmother, they used to enter into the shooting competitions back in like the 70s and 80s. And as you can tell from all the trophies on the table, they're they're pretty good, apparently. And so these, this is just telling another side of their story of their lives in just a unique way that we might not think of at first. I'll go back to Joe for more family sources. Yeah, some other examples include uh, books of remembrance or scrapbooks. Um, this is an example of a book of remembrance, the white one that my grandma put together and then another from my grandfather, it's uh, the blue one. And these can, uh, uh, unlike the other sources that we've been talking about, which are kind of individual uh, separate items that uh, maybe have limited context and, and until someone gathers them together and kind of links the information between them, uh, there may not be um, as, as much of a story to be told. Um, but these things like scrapbooks or books of remembrance, these are things that people have taken time to compile some things together and um, to kind of put together somewhat of the narrative of the family. So uh, in my grandma's book of remembrance, for example, she has uh, birth certificates of my father and his sister, uh, baby photos of them, uh, there's the, my grandparents' marriage certificate there um, and other things that document uh, in a chronological way uh, the, the family uh, story of their immediate family. Uh, and then also she wrote some things about my Icelandic ancestors. She was half Icelandic and uh, she knew her grandfather um, who was um, from Iceland. And uh, she took the time to type up uh, his story. And that's how we learned about their journey from Iceland to America and uh, going from the uh, uh, beautiful green uh, seaside home in Iceland to this high mountain desert in, uh, in Utah and their struggles living in a dugout, things like that. Uh, so, uh, these are good things to look for in your own uh, collection and at your, in your home that you may have or from other family members that uh, may have uh, such resources. Another example of a compiled source is uh, actual books that people uh, have published. Um, in many cases, uh, books like these haven't been published on a wide scale, but really on a very limited scale. Um, maybe only 50 or 100 copies uh, ever made and given to the family members at the time uh, and then never reprinted after that. So these can be a real rare find and they're really valuable when you can find them. These two books are ones that um, my wife's sister worked on in collaboration with some other family members. When she was just only in her um, early 20s, she took an active interest in, in this and, and helped uh, compile these books that are now treasures to us about uh, the family. And then uh, journals. Um, these are actually two of my own journals. Uh, my mother gave me my first journal, uh, the Gnome notebook that you see there on, on the left, um, when I was only seven years old as a Christmas present. And I uh, took great interest in the idea of journaling and began uh, keeping uh, more or less the daily uh, record of my life. Um, and through my teenage years, I got kind of lazy and wasn't writing in as often, but uh, picked up again as I grew into adulthood. And I now have over 25 journals that I have uh, compiled uh, through the years. Now I do it electronically. Um, and there's things in there that I learned about my family that I wrote down, but have since forgotten. So it's good to be able to go back and reread those. Um, but then also, you know, you, you can look for other family members who may have kept their journals, and uh, including grandparents or even great uh, grandparents and beyond. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so where do you look for these family sources? You start with looking in your own house. You look, you know, wherever you might think to find them in file cabinets, in the attic, the basement, garage, in closets, and bookshelves, wherever you think you might find um, any of these types of sources that you're looking for. And then once we look for the physical copies, 
we need to remember to look for the digital as well. So looking through your computer files or your email or messages between you and your family, those are also great places to look for these family sources. And so this picture is um, from a project I was doing two years ago at the library with Joe. And it comes from the, the trunk that you see on the table filled with letters came from this man who brought it in and he said that he had inherited it from his father and his father, as the story goes, um, had been working on some kind of documentary about John Wayne and he ended up with this trunk full of letters that he thought was associated in some way with John Wayne, but he wasn't quite sure. And so what I did in this project was to read through some of the letters and kind of figure out what they were about and I figured out that they were about John Wayne's great granduncle, um, whose name is Marion Morrison, who John Wayne is actually named after because his name John Wayne is his actor name. And then his birth name, I guess you would say, is Marion Morrison. And this is just kind of a, a unlikely example, I guess, of where you might, you never know where you might find family sources that might come from someone you don't even know. Or just, you know, looking in trunks like this, you might find the treasure trove. So that's just a fun little story. And then after you search out family sources in your own home, you start asking your relatives. And remember that living memory is another very important family source because what people remember about their relatives and their family is also super important and should be recorded. And so ask Asking your family members includes asking your parents, your grandparents, your siblings, your children, and find out if they have any information or any other sources that you might not have so that you can continue gathering them. And then you can expand the network to more distant relatives. So the photo that we have here is of like a family reunion. So anyone you might think of when you go to a family reunion, like cousins, second, third cousins, once removed, aunts and uncles, great aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, you start asking them on um, what they have and just continue to expand that family network as well as looking for sources that you want to gather for your collection. And then once we've um, done family, we can expand the network even more. So you can see that on the screen, we have the word FAN spelled out, F-A-N. And this is a genealogical term that is commonly used, and it stands for family and friends, associates, and neighbors. And that means your family and friends, your associates, your neighbors. Um, these are the people that know you and your life. And so they're going to have information about you and your family. And when you're collecting these sources, ask these people if they have anything. And you also want to not only ask people in your own fan network, but those of your ancestors. For example, my grandfather, he has a best friend who he um, was on the same mission with, uh, went to BYU together, ended up at the same graduate school and taught at Ricks College together. And so they spent most of their life around each other. And because of that, my family has a lot of photos of him, of this friend, and um, I'm sure if I were to ask them, they would have photos of my grandfather. So that's just an example of someone just thinking outside the box of someone you might ask for these kinds of sources. And so that is another great way to be able to collect family sources. And then the last way we're going to talk about is connecting on social media with your family. Um, I'm part of a basic group for one of my um grandparents, and that just connects me to more distant cousins that I might not ever meet in person, but I can connect to online through Facebook, Instagram, whichever social media you want to use. And another great way to connect to family is online through genealogical websites such as Family Search or Ancestry, because you can typically see who is added to the tree or who has made changes, as you can see on the photo, and then you can message them on the website and then create a connection and gather resources and information from them as well. All right, so when it comes to broadening your network beyond yourself and your immediate family that you know well, um, 
you need to be able to build some trust. Uh, we live in an age when there's a lot of uh, bad stuff happening out there on the internet. There's scams, there's phone scams, there's internet scams, there's email scams. And so people are wary of this. And so if you contact somebody out of the blue and tell them that you're their distant relative and that you have some information to share with them, they're immediately potentially going to um, uh, kind of uh, have that uh, uh, that uh, warning um, in their in their mind go off that maybe uh, I shouldn't trust this person. And so, what can you do to um, overcome that and uh, basically um, get in the door, uh, either literally or figuratively, uh, to being able to talk to them? Uh, let alone being uh, uh, able to ask them to share with you their family sources um, and their uh, their memories. Well, um, one of the things that you can do is, uh, well, first of all, begin begin with those that you do know well. Um, so uh, uh, you can talk to your parents or your siblings or other uh, living family members. Uh, to uh, go and visit them, uh, interview them, uh, ask them if they have uh, compiled uh, uh, sources or uh, of photographs and letters or other sources. And then um, next you can ask them to refer you to someone else. Um, so a referral is often a really great way to uh, break the ice. Um, so as an example of this, um, I was, we worked on a project together actually, and, and some other students were involved in this as well with um, a bookstore locally here in uh, Provo, Utah called Pioneer Book. And the late founder of this bookstore, Richard Horsley, uh, was passionate about family history and collected over 500 family history books um, mostly about uh, pioneers to Utah. Um, and so when he passed away, he left in his will a request that these books be placed in the hands of descendants. And so we've partnered with Pioneer Book to help um, make that possible by doing some research about each individual book, finding descendants of those um, that uh, are uh, in the book, and then contacting them to offer them uh, to receive that book from us. And it was a really rewarding and, and awesome project, wasn't it, Megan? Yeah. Um, we had some really great uh, reactions from people who were just so grateful to receive these. But uh, now and then we would have people who were not trusting this process. Uh, you know, Megan calls them out of the blue and tells them about this. And uh, they're, they end up calling me and, and saying, I, I got this call from someone purporting to be a student can I trust uh, that, that this is a real thing? And I would assure them that it was. Um, well, um, besides just giving them a good introduction and, and uh, uh, another way that you can um, gain trust is through, like I mentioned earlier, a referral. So one of the books that we had was a uh, biography and family history about um, the mother of the Osmond brothers. And um, when we came across this book, I, I looked at it and wondered, what am I going to do? Just cold call Donnie and Marie and, and, and offer this book to them? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so, um, but it so happened that my mother it has a second cousin who was married to Alan Osmond. And so I contacted my mother and I told her that we have this book and she put me in touch with the wife, with her second cousin, the wife of Alan Osmond. Uh, and so it wasn't a cold call. I was able to reach out to her and she already had been uh, given a heads up from my mother that I was going to be contacting her and why. And so when I did contact her and she was able to put me on the phone with her, with her husband, Alan Osmond himself, and uh, later was able to uh, visit them in their home and present this book to them. But it was all made possible through this referral uh, that, because he told me when, when I visited him, because uh, I, when, I, when I made the phone call, he said, I usually don't answer the phone because it could be a fan. And uh, 
and while I love my fans, you know, I, I have a personal life. And, but he saw, uh, um, or he, you know, he knew from, uh, that his wife was expecting, uh, to be contacted. And so they, they answered the phone and, and talked to me and facilitated that visit. So, uh, take time to build that trust and, uh, use, use, uh, that referral, uh, process to be able to get in the door. Um, other things to do to help build trust. Um, one is to, uh, uh, just respect their time and their privacy. Uh, don't immediately expect that, uh, when you first get them on the phone or sit down with them, that they're going to tell you their whole life story or that they're going to share with you all their, uh, family, uh, treasures, uh, that they have in their possession. It may take more than one visit to be able to build up that trust, uh, to get them to share things with you. And they may share limited things with you at first and then more with you as they feel more comfortable in, uh, talking with you. Um, be willing to, uh, give as well as to receive, to share uh, things with them that, that you know about that they may not know or copies of things that you have that they may not have seen. And also be willing to uh, do the legwork. Um, if you're going to get into doing things such as digitizing uh, documents or transcribing um, uh, uh, oral histories or something, um, be willing to offer to, to save them the trouble of doing the, doing the work. Uh, that will help to, to gain their trust as well. Here's an example. Um, something you can do is actually create something to share. My grandmother, uh, back in the 1980s, did an oral history interview with um, the great aunt of my grandfather. And um, she recorded that on a cassette tape. And I lived with my grandfather for a time and was able to um, uh, have access to this cassette tape. And I listened to it and I made a full transcription of it by just typing up every word that was that I could hear on the tape. And there were some things that related to my grandfather's ancestry, but it was actually mostly about this great aunt and her family and their children. And so it wasn't really so relevant to my direct, uh, you know, family story. But I thought, um, wouldn't the descendants of this um, ancestor uh, like to have a copy of this? And so I just got the phone book out and I started calling people and they had that, that surname Everett in Springville, Utah. And uh, the first person actually that I contacted I asked them, are you related to Frankie or Rufus Everett? And, uh, and he's the person on the phone said, yeah, that's my, that's my grandma and grandpa. And, uh, I was invited to come over and, and visit with them. And I met, uh, the father who was the son of, uh, this Frankie and, uh, and Rufus and, uh, shared with them this, a copy of the cassette and a copy of the transcription. Uh, this is, 25, 30, almost 30 years ago now. And so this is before we had digital stuff. So I was actually giving them a physical copy of the tape. Anyway, um, in the process of visiting with them, um, they said, don't, we don't want you to leave. We have another person coming over to talk with you. And, and it turned out that she is the family genealogist in that branch of the family. She's not even a blood relative. She married into the family, but she's passionate about genealogy. And when she arrived, she brought this box full of family papers and things, things I had never seen before. And one of my favorite examples of this is this uh, map that, uh, uh, so Frankie, uh, uh, the great aunt of my grandfather had do, done some correspondence in the 1960s uh, and with a, with a lawyer who was able to go and do some research in the, in the county records and also who talked to living descendants of our common ancestor in Alabama. And this uh, living descendant actually drew this map um, by hand of the... Uh, family uh, farm 
And you can see the creeks there, or you can see there was an Everett family graveyard and the homes of some of the other uh, children in the family that they later built. What a treasure that this was, um, among many other things that were in that box uh, that this, um, uh, basically, she it would have been the, the wife of like a third cousin that I was uh, uh, communicating with. And I had no idea that that this information was even available. And it's only because I had uh, taken the time to go and share something I had created um, from uh, from a family source that I had found that I was able to get access to these things. All right. Megan's going to talk with us about gathering and preserving family sources. Yeah. <clears throat> so now that you've gathered all of your sources, you have to organize them and do what you can to preserve them. So this is a photo that I found on Family Search, and it's a photo of my great grandparents. And as you can tell, it's not a very quality scan. Um, the colors are kind of off, the shadows are really dark, it's kind of blurry. But while I was looking through some of the photos that I had, I found the original photo right here. And as you can see, there is a quite a big difference between the scan that I found on Family Search versus the one I did from the original. And this is just an example to show how important it is to have the originals of the sources, because first of all, you can do quality scans of them, but also it just preserves this memory and the source that you have of your ancestors. And that is so important to preserve. And we recommend preserving originals and then using digital copies for sharing rather than replacing the originals if you can avoid it. And here's some other examples. Um, so these two photos, as you can tell, have um, received some damage over the years. The one on the left is of my aunt and there's some creasing and folding and breakage of the photo. And then the one on the right, you can see the discoloration from water damage and like the cut corner. And so this is why it's very important to be careful how you store these originals so that you can preserve them for later use and uh, later generations. And so some of the things we recommend doing is um, be careful to clean off these originals with a dry brush or a cloth and um, avoid using things that could damage them, such as tape or glue, uh, sticky notes, paper clips or staples. Remove those if they're on them as, uh, as you can without damaging them further because sometimes things get stuck to a page because they're glued on. So just use your best, best judgment in um, removing these things that add to the degradation of the originals. And also avoid writing on originals if possible. But if you do, for example, on like a photo, just write on the back with a soft graphite pencil. That'll help preserve it better. And then this is an example from um, Joe, Joe's collection. He has a book of a family history, and you can tell on the left is a picture of a paper clip that had gotten used to stick a piece of paper into the book, and the paper clip started to rust, and it damaged the page that, of the book that it was in, and you can see it even, like, kind of lifted up the paper and left rust marks everywhere, so that's part of the reason why we need to take off things like paper clips because they really do damage these things. But also another thing is looking in these books because sometimes you might find a hidden gem. Like the picture on the right is a, I believe it's a transcription. Yes. Yeah, that's a transcription that someone made of an autobiography that was written by a, a, a like it's fifth generation mm -hmm. uh, great grandfather um, that uh, they copied it out by hand from uh original copy that they found in a museum and placed it in this book for yeah. me to discover decades <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah. And so when preserving things like photos or papers, um, put the originals in containers that um, will help preserve them. And for things such as photos, we um, recommend putting them in sleeves where you just slide them in and out. Um, there's a particular photo album type that was very popular 
back in, I believe, the 80s. It's called uh, Magnetic Photo Albums, and they're kind of, the pages are sticky with this film that goes over it that was meant to, like, hold the the photos to the page. But um, we now know that the the adhesive that they use in those contain acid, and that um, can start to damage or degrade your photos. And so it's very important that you take it out of those kinds of albums and then put them in some kind of sleeve or binder that can help uh, preserve them. And as well as using sleeves or binders, you can use boxes or folders. Just make sure that whatever you're using is uh, kept in a clean and dry place and use acid-free materials. So the picture of the box on the right is one of the photo album boxes that I have, and it's an acid-free box. And if you just search acid-free box or go somewhere, you should be able to find these. They're pretty common. And you can use whatever organizational system that you want, that whatever makes sense to you while you're organizing and preserving your sources. So here's a funny little meme about um, making copies. So the awkward moment when you put something in a safe place so you don't lose it and then you forget where the safe place is. So make sure when you are making copies or uh, organizing your sources that you remember where you put them so you don't lose them. And so now we're going to talk about digitizing. So phones are a very great resource to use when you want to make digital copies of your sources. And modern phones are very good with high resolution photos or scanning apps that you can use to take pictures or scan your, your photos, your documents, whatever it is you have um, to preserve as digital copies. And if you don't want to use your phone, there are also um, physical scanners that you can use. Uh, this picture comes from the BYU Family History Library. They have a lot of scanning equipment there. Um, you can check your local library or family search center, and they may have scanning equipment that you can go in and use for your uh, preservation of, of these things. Or you can purchase your own scanning equipment, depending on if you feel like it's a good investment. If you have a lot of things, um, it might be a good thing to think about. And then, so this is a principle that is about making copies. Uh, it's called locks. It's lots of copies keep stuff safe. And so it's just another reason to make copies of things so that you don't lose them, like in this little meme we have here. Uh, you don't want to lose it because if you don't make a copy of it, it's too late. And then, yeah, you don't want this to happen to you either, where you accidentally delete something and that was your only copy that you had, and then you just have nothing else to do. So make sure that you have copies in multiple places of either printed out of the original or a digital copy somewhere that you keep. And as you're making copies, remember to refresh whatever thing you're using from an older format to a newer format. For example, taking something off of a floppy disk or a DVD and changing it to something you can store on the cloud or on an external hard drive. That'll help you make sure you know where your things are and know that you have copies of it in a safe place that you can access at a later date. And then this is an example of online organization that Joe uses for his own family history. So he can talk about that. Sure, yeah. Um, so just as you need to organize your physical family sources into folders or boxes or, or other um, store, uh, organizational methods, you also need to organize your digital copies of things. And there's many different ways you could do it. This is just a method that I use uh, that, um, you might try if uh, if it works for you. So if you think about your pedigree chart, uh, you've got uh, you as the first generation, then your parents as the second, your grandparents as the third generation, and so on. And then at each level, at each generational level, um, you've got um, households. So um, in, in the first generation, it's just your own household. The second generation is your parents' household. And then as you get into the third generation, you've got two households. You've got your, your paternal and your maternal uh, uh, grandparents. And so I represent those as generation 3.1 and 3.2. When you get to the fourth generation, now there's four of them. Uh, so those are represented as 4.1 through 4.4 and so on. Uh, eight in the 
uh, fifth generation, 16 in the sixth generation, et cetera. So that's how I organized my main folders of my genealogy going backward. And then with, if you open one of these folders, you, you will see something like what's on the right, where I, uh, there's a folder for each of the children in that family. And then um, uh, the direct line person is actually a shortcut folder back to the main folder that's on the left um, for that person. And then individual documents within these folders, I also have a method of naming them that is intuitive to me. Uh, so uh, um, if it's a, a picture of a birth uh, document, then I'll have uh, BIR. If it's a death uh, record, DEA. Um, FB in this case stands for family book or in German Familienbuch. Uh, this is a, a record type that you find in particularly Württemberg, Germany. And so that I use FB, marriage is MAR, et cetera. And then um, I also keep my research log for this ancestor in this uh, same folder. So just an idea for you if you uh, want to try this as an organization principle, um, but uh, it's just one example of many you could choose. Right. And then uh, we've also in the uh, syllabus for this class, which should be uh, available to you through the app, um, we have links to a couple of resources. One is from the United States Library of Congress, uh, which has a research guide on preserving family, family documents and artifacts. And then there's also a, a similar resource on the U.S. National Archives website, um, How to Preserve Family Archives. It also includes uh, it, tips for digitizing these. So uh, we recommend that you uh, check out those two resources for some tips um, beyond what we're sharing with you today. All right. Now, what if you, um, we talked earlier about uh, gathering your own family sources and digitizing them, but what if you don't have possession of items? What if they belong to other people? Um, what do you do? Well, you may be, uh, lucky enough that they would be willing to just give you those original sources um, and, and let you be the custodian of them. Um, sometimes people have things in their possession, but they're not really that interested in them, or they may be interested in them, but they feel like they aren't the best ones to care for them, and that someone like you might be better uh, positioned to to care about them because you care a lot about it and you have some know-how about what to do with it. And so um, that obviously is the ideal situation is if someone be, would be willing that, to give them to you. Granted, that comes with a bit of a price because it's kind of a blessing and a curse, a blessing that you get to uh, be the owner of those resources. But uh, on the other hand, you also now are responsible to take care of them. And, that may mean making space in your home for them uh, physically and ensuring that uh, they're, they're preserved. For me personally, that I, I love to be able to be in that position. Um, not everyone is quite uh, ready to do that, though, so you may uh, look to collaborate with other family members to, sh to share that, that load. Now, one of the things that's uh, advisable to do is to put out there the fact that you are the one that's interested in family history in your family uh, so that when that great aunt is um, maybe thinking of tossing away a box of old family sources that she, you know, have just been cluttering at her garage before she goes to throw that away, she'll think of you because she's heard that you are into family history and that you like to collect these kinds of things. So, um, don't don't be shy in sharing with with people that uh, you love family history and that you're uh, happy to become the custodian of these things. Now, another option, if people um, aren't ready to entrust you with their family sources, is you might be able to borrow them temporarily. Uh, you might be able to uh, pick them up from their home and then take them. Uh, to your home to digitize them or maybe take them and uh, digitize them somewhere else and then return the items to them. 
again, that requires building that trust before they're going to be willing to uh, give those things over to you. Um, if they're not comfortable with either of those options, then another possibility is to go with them to scan the things together at a library or other location that has that equipment. You might um, even, if you have your own equipment, uh, or maybe you can borrow equipment, uh, to take into their home and digitize it right there on site in their home. <clears throat> All right, now I wanna talk about um, oral history. So we've been talking a lot about physical items and how to uh, gather them and how to uh, preserve them and share them. Um, but also we need to think about how to capture the memories of living people and conducting oral histories or interviewing people and recording that uh, is a really, great way to do that. So some tips for doing oral histories. First thing to do is to prepare in advance um, with the questions that you would like to ask. It's a good idea to write those down and think, think carefully about them beforehand. As you're crafting questions, you want to think of questions that are open-ended, questions that can get them telling stories, not just yes or no questions or one word answer questions. Um, of course, you do want to get a few things up front. Like it's a good idea when you're first beginning the, the interview to ask them to state their name, uh, maybe some basic information like when and where they were born. And then you should also um, record uh, up front the date and the place where they went, when and where the interview is happening. Um, so um, once you have your questions prepared and you're ready to sit down with someone to interview them, of course, you need to have their permission to record it. Uh, don't uh, record them without their knowledge, but uh, ask them if it's okay if you do so. Now, just like phones can be um, really a good resource for uh, or tool for uh, digitizing documents or photographs, they can also be a good tool for uh, these oral history interviews. Um, even uh, some of the older uh, uh, smartphones these days have really high quality um, microphones and um, video recording uh, with good resolution. If you want something that is a little better than a phone, of course you can. Uh, consider getting um, a, a higher-end camera. You might consider also having an external microphone. Whatever you choose to use as equipment, um, you'll want to test it first before the interview. Um, test it at home before you go to the interview and test it a little bit before you actually begin the interview on site and make sure that everything's working. Make sure that the sound is good and that the uh, the you can see the individual if you're capturing video that you can see them well. You may want to use a tripod. Uh, that's usually best unless you have someone else that can maybe um, hold the phone while you're doing that interview. Okay. Um, you want to avoid distractions. So turn off the TV, turn off the radio. If possible, hold the interview in a place where you're not going to hear um, noisy pets or maybe kids running around. Um, so that uh, it doesn't disrupt the audio quality. And during the interview, it's important to uh, help the person that you're interviewing feel comfortable and natural. Let the conversation flow. Don't interrupt them. Even if they go off topic and aren't answering the question that you asked, that's okay. Just let them talk. Um, when they're finished, then you can ask your question again or restate it uh, to get at the information that you're looking for. Of course, again, be respectful. They may not want to share certain things with you, and that's okay. Um, uh, and maybe in that first interview, they won't, but if you uh, continue to build trust in a relationship, maybe at a later time, they'd be willing to share that. Okay. Um, another tip when you're doing uh, interviews is to have something to help jog their memory. A photo album can be a great way to do this. Now, if you're going to have them talking about a photo album, while you're recording them, you're going to want to take notes as you go. Um, and if possible, uh, try to prompt them to say something about 
the photo enough to describe it so that later on you can correlate the uh, uh, that oral history that they told to the specific photo that they were talking about. Um, and it's also good to go in order, like in, uh, in, in order of the album, or if you have a stack of photos in a particular order, and then preserve that order. That will make it easier for you to correlate the stories to the photos later. I mentioned taking notes. Um, even though you're recording everything, just in case you don't pick up on something, or if it maybe there's an idea for another question you want to follow up with, you can note that down as you go. There's some, uh, this is also linked in your syllabus. Uh, this is a, a, resource, um, a research guide that I created on the BYU Library website for oral history. It includes both resources where you can search and listen to oral histories, as well as um, links to resources where you can learn more about how to conduct oral histories. All right. All right. So now we're going to give you some quick tips about extracting information from these family sources that you can use. Um, so here we have two photos. Um, and as you can see, the one on the left, there's some handwriting at the bottom. And it says two month and then Jojo 14 month. And so I know that this is a photo of my grandfather holding my mom and uh, my aunt. And so from this context, I know that the two month is how old my mom was in the photo. And then Jojo, that is the nickname of my aunt. Her name is Joanne. And 14 months is the age of my aunt in the photo. So this is just a tip of figuring out details that you can pull from things. Look for writing or things like that that can help you identify who's in the photo, when it was taken, stuff like that. And then the photo on the right is my grandmother. And um, if you recognize the place, it's pretty obvious. Uh, she was visiting Washington, Washington DC. And so you can look at the photo and see if they're in a very you know, recognizable place and be able to place them and figure out maybe when they were there, who they were there with and other things like that. And you just wanna look for names, places, dates, relationships, any details that you can extract from these sources to build on your research. And then one other way to figure out maybe where a photo might have been taken, I have this photo right here of a waterfall. And um, if you're from Utah County, you probably already recognize this. But if you don't recognize where this photo is from, if you think it's a pretty recognizable place, what you can do is you can do a reverse Google image search. So you go on Google Images and you upload the photo to the Google image reverse image search, and it might come up with results. And it did for this one. This is a picture of Bridalville Falls. And as you can see, it came up with other pictures that were taken there and it uh, helped me identify it. And it can be a help um, to you as well if you have photos like that. And then when you are handling things like documents, you also want to search for things such as names, places, dates, and other details. Um, this is an example of a letter that I had from the um, the John Wayne thing. And so these are some of like the names and the places that I pulled out from this document just on the different parts of the page. And so that is some tips for doing that. All right. So as you go uh, through these family sources that you have compiled, uh, you're, as, as Megan said, you're going to want to uh, uh, take note of the key information, the names, dates, place, and re places, and relationships. And then you're going to want to record that. We recommend that you uh, record that in some kind of family tree uh, software uh, system. That may be an online tree or it may be uh, like a family uh, tree software uh, program that you install on your computer. It's actually a good idea to have both uh, of those things, uh, a shared tree that you can collaborate with other people, such as Family Search, as well as another tree, either in a software program or maybe on another website that is uh, more um, in your control and, and that where other people aren't going to be changing it. Uh, and that way, having both, you get the best of both worlds of the collaboration on the one hand, and then being able to keep track of what you actually have verified and, and that you know from your own uh, 
study of the of the sources. As you build out your this, the tree with what you know from your own memory and from family memories and from these family sources, you'll start to see where there may be some gaps, and those will uh, become your questions for further research. And later on in this getting started track, we're going to talk about those later steps and how you can uh, build on uh, this beginning of your tree uh, to go into extending it further through uh, historical documents. Now, another good idea, and this goes for family sources as well as historical documents, is to keep what we call a research log. Um, and this is just an example of like a template that you might follow. Uh, what you want to do is for each thing that you look at, um, you're going to want to record when you looked at it, um, enough information about the source that you can identify it later or that someone else could identify it. So if there's a title or an author or some other description you can give to it, where you found it and what it is, and then notes about the source. And it's important when you take notes about the source to differentiate between what the source actually says and what your interpretation of it is. Personally, what I do is um, in my notes, I will use just regular type of font for um, things that I actually saw in on that photo or in that document. And then my own interpretation of it, I'm going to put into brackets, square brackets, or into italics. And that tells me um, that that's my own take on it rather than what the actual original said. And the other thing that's important to record is if you have a digital copy of that item, where is that kept? What's the file name or link to that digital copy? Now, keep in mind that family sources, just like really any source in family history, might contain inaccurate or incomplete information. This is a um, biography of one of my ancestors from Germany, and it contains a few things that are inaccurate, um, just from the, the nature of how it came down to us. Um, and yet, despite those uh, inaccuracies, there was enough detail here, enough clues to actually enable us to trace uh, back to his original records in Germany. Um, this is a copy of his original birth record in the church records in Germany. And we were able to find it thanks to the family source, even though the family source has some inaccuracies. Now, of course, reading documents like this is another story. Uh, don't be overwhelmed by that right now. Um, just uh, uh, know that uh, you can get some help along the way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a sec. Uh, family sources, uh, they can provide valuable information and evidence, uh, some of it which may not be found from any other source and vital clues for your further research, even when they might be incomplete or inaccurate in some respects. Um, other sessions in this beginner track will help you uh, to find and evaluate information from other sources that can be compared to your family sources as evidence to make the right conclusions about your family history. And as I mentioned, don't be afraid to ask for help along the way. Um, don't be daunted by things like that hard German handwriting. There are people can, that can help with that at family search centers around the world. Uh, there's virtual reference that you can access with, from the Family Search Library, for example, or your local library may have uh, uh, staff or volunteers that uh, help with family history as well. So thank you for your time today, um, and I hope you've learned some new things from this uh, session. Remember that if you have any feedback, you can give it through the Roots Tech mobile app. And uh, I'll just end with this uh, slide with their contact information. Uh, this is contact information for the BYU uh, Library Family History Center. Um, that's one way that you can uh, ask some follow-up questions. We don't have time, I'm afraid, for any other questions. So uh, thank you for your time and hope you have a great uh, rest of your time at Rootstech. Thank you.